If you're with us in person, please stand and let's sing together. My life is yours And my hope is in you only And my heart you hold Cause you made this sinner
Yes, you are good. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Jesus, you are good. Good morning, good morning, good morning. How many of you are excited about the week ahead? We enter in Passion Week knowing that we have a glorious God that we get to go and serve this week. We have a glorious God that we get to go praise this week. Not only today, but all the week long. How many of you excited about that today? This Passion Week, this sacred week that we get to enter into. I'm Ashley Troutman. I'll lead us in parts of our worship today. Um, join us in our call to worship, which is from Psalms 103, verses 1 through 5, and it reads, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquity? Who heals all your diseases? Who de redeems your life from the pit? Who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy? Who satisfies you with good so that your, your youth is renewed like the eagles? You may be seated. Join me in our prayer of adoration and confession. Father God, as we just sung, you are glorious, marvelous, wonderful, immaculate. We just stare at you and just praise you right here in this verse. Father, you are so great because it is you that, is, as we just read, that forgives us from our iniquities. It's you, Father, that heals us. You heal diseases. You redeem our lives out of deep, deepless, dark pits. You, Father, you are the one that crowns us with steadfast love. You love us with steadfastness, and you give out so much mercy. Father, you satisfy us. You are our satisfaction, and there is none other like you. You are holy, 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 so much so that it is you that can restore and renew things back to their youth, back to their their, their, their newness and fullness of life. But Father, Father God, forgive us. For gracious God, although you ask us to bless you and praise you, Father, we get so enamored with your creation that we praise everything else but you. Instead of blessing you and praising you, we praise ourselves and the people around us. Instead of recognizing your benefits we recognize and praise those again those around us we praise the doctor for his skill at healing us but we forget to praise you we praise our justice system sometimes for keeping us out of harm's way or, or restoring relationships but we forget to praise you for god father god forgive us forgive us for these things because without you all those good things are not possible, for you are the, the source of all things good in our lives, and you are the source of everything that is good, good around us. We ask that you would forgive us for these things, and we ask these in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our assurance of pardon comes from Psalms 103, verses 8 through 12, and it reads, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. can come forward to collect the offering. You can also give through our uh, website, trinitylakeland.org, or you can download our uh, app to give. Uh, please sing along with us. Uh. 
Please stand. Let's continue to sing together. Lord, you're weeping with me. Help me to believe that when my heart is heavy as a stone, Pour all of us. 
and walked out of the grave. Lord, you're aching with me. Help me to
future's holding Whatever tomorrow brings Oh, one thing I know is certain I just need you Shelter I need you Shelter All right, confessing our faith together using the Westminster Shorter Catechism. I'll read the questions, and let's answer together. Who is the Redeemer of God's elect? The only Redeemer of God's elect is the Lord Jesus Christ, who being the eternal Son of God, became man, and so was and continueth to be God and man in two distinct natures, and one person forever. How did Christ, being the Son of God, become man? Christ, the Son of God, became man by taking to himself a true body and a reasonable soul, being conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost in the womb of the Virgin Mary and born of her yet without sin. Amen. You may be seated. We've got a few announcements uh, before we let the kids out. Good morning. I just wanted to make a few announcements uh, for you all. One of them is that immediately following this service, we have our annual church picnic. So hopefully you've prepared for that and planned for that. If you have not, don't worry. You can still join us. We'd love to have you, uh, but that'll be immediate immediately following the service over at Fletcher Park. And then a few other things. If you are new to Trinity, I wanted to direct your attention to a couple things. One of them, we would love to find out more information about you so that we can help you get connected here at Trinity. One of the ways to do that is to scan the QR code on the back of the worship folder. And then also we have an opportunity coming up in a few weeks on April 12th and 13th you'll see the flyer for our Weekender. The Weekender is the primary way for you to get connected here at Trinity. It's a way for you to find out more information about the church, our history, our core values, and what it looks like for you to be involved and engaged here at Trinity. So you can sign the, scan, the QR code as well for that to sign up. We do need to know that you're coming because we have childcare provided, and we also have dinner on Friday night and breakfast on Saturday morning provided as well. So that's why it's helpful for you to RSVP and let us know that you're coming. And then a couple uh, other things. One is the student ministry is doing a fundraiser and informational luncheon on Sunday, April 7th. That's immediately following the second service. 
So I just would encourage you, God is doing some really amazing things with our youth right now. There were over 125 students this week at FRAT. That's middle school and high school. And so if you want to know more about what's going on, maybe how to get involved, how to volunteer, or just even what's happening with your children, then I would encourage you to attend that luncheon uh, on April 7th. So thank you very much. All right, kids are dismissed. Infants through fifth grade are dismissed. And the rest of you may stand and greet each other. Maybe walk across the aisle. Shake a hand of a stranger this morning. Go ahead and return to your seats. Tim and Justin keeps reminding me I'm not in the old Baptist church. We're not standing here all day doing greetings. But we'll continue in our service. I ask that you would join us in our prayer of Thanksgiving and intercession. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your committed work, your faithfulness towards your mission. For your mission included pursuing me and pursuing each of my friends here in this room. You pursued us with great passion. You pursued us with passion and you laid down your life. With passion, you laid down your life and you pursued towards death on a cross for my sake, for our sake. That death on the cross provided us a newfound hope, one like no other. But not only did it provide hope that we had yet so seen or experienced, but it also provided us comfort knowing that we were in the presence, in the embrace, in the love and security of a great father. So we thank you for your passion and your work for with that came his presence, even when we are in overwhelming situations, he's present. He tells us in your, word, in your word to fear not, for the waters that surround us won't drown us, for when we walk through fire, we won't be burned, because we are precious to him. As Timo would say, he delights in us so that we can delight in him. 
Lord Jesus, we thank you for that work. As we look beyond ourselves, we ask that you would intercede on the lives of, of our friends, our family, that may be outside of that type of hope, that need to be introduced and find a new hope, that hope that you provide in you. Use us, Father, this week and beyond this week in our own passions to identify and help bring those to the marvelous light that is in you. As we look even further beyond our own borders, Father, there's wars happening all around us. There's war in Haiti. There is kidnappings in Nigeria. There is conflict consistently in Gaza. Father, we ask that you would bring peace in the presence of the one tr true Savior that can bring, our, bring hope and justice in, in no, all those situations. And where they are believers in those, in those spaces, would you comfort them with, their, with your ever-present ever -present power to let and remind them that you are with them? We ask these things. Father, as we turn to your preaching of your word, we ask that you would be with Tim, that your spirit would dwell within him, and that you would prepare our hearts and our ears for what he has to share for us. We ask these in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. My name is Teresa Riggs. I'm going to read our sermon text for us this morning, found in Luke 23 with some verses from 26 to 49. And as they led him away, they seized one Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. And there followed him a great multitude of the people and of women who were mourning and lamenting for him. Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments, and the people stood by watching. But the ruler scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds that had assembled for the spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home, beating their breasts. And all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance, watching these things. Thank you, Teresa. If you're new or visiting Trinity, we are doing a short series last week, today, and next week, just looking at the gospel, the narrative from Luke 24 of this prep for the death of Christ is what we looked at last week with Brown, this week looking at the crucifixion proper, and then next week looking at Luke 24 at the resurrection. When you get to the topic of crucifixion, there's a sense in which this can be so familiar in ways in which we make assumptions in Christian culture, like Jesus died for you and then he was crucified as if this is like this of course kind of you know, assumption 
but I want to be careful because there's aspects of a crucifixion that may slip by you, or there's ways in which if you've not done some kind of thorough study of it, you may not really realize the fullness of what was entailed, not just in the physical event, but in the meaning that's ascribed to it. Okay, because there's not just this idea of what, but it's the why. And we really believe, we say this around here a lot, that it's not just, if you do not have the words of Jesus, you don't have the Christian faith. Uh, the Romans crucified tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people. Why is the crucifixion, crucifixion of one Jew so significant? And it's because of what Jesus tells you is happening in that particular death. Uh, if you don't understand what was happening in a crucifixion particularly, uh, why is it that there's this unique view of what this really accomplished, okay? So that's really the focus of today and what we want to look at. It's, a, it's good to begin our Passion Week. I know traditionally it's this Palm Sunday, but since we don't do a Maundy Thursday or a Good Friday service, then we're kind of moving that up to today. And we're going to take a look at just at this very clear focus. Books and books and books have been written about this. Okay, I'm not, there's no way I'm going to get at the full depths of everything that could be said. But hopefully, just in terms of a, a point of focus, a clarity and a meaning, as hopefully you can come away from this with a richer sense, if you are a Christian, of what it is that God in Christ has done for you. And if you're not a Christian, that you would maybe consider why this is something that is so real and so life-changing. Okay? Uh, if you want to follow along in the outline we've provided, we're going to look first at the act— and we're going to, that's where we say we're going to have human lens, a Roman lens. What's happening? Just humanly speaking, what was it? How, did it? how was it viewed? Secondly, we're going to look at the horror and the meaning from we get the heavenly lens and the things in which we know from Jesus' own words and the words of his apostles, and we get a fuller understanding of what is attached to the significance of this event divinely or from an eternal perspective, okay? And then lastly, we're going to see the impact. And when we use unimaginable, it's because nobody saw this coming. Nobody, none of Jesus' disciples, maybe with the exception where Mary, when Mary anoints his feet right, you know, right before his crucifixion, and Jesus says, to her it has been given, as if maybe other than Mary, nobody else saw this coming. So in the unimaginable impact of what was real, it would fit. If you know your Bible, and remember in Ephesians chapter 3, it says, now to him who's able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or even imagine. We, our scope, imagination can go this far, but then God goes farther. And just in the same way as we view the significance of the death of Jesus, we might be able to think this far, but God goes farther. And we really want to make sure that we understand that impact, because that's where the consequences really land in your life and in mind, okay? So let's look first, just the humanly speaking, first question we have there, what actually happens in a crucifixion, and in Jesus' crucifixion in particular? Uh, I don't want to go into the deep dive of the particulars physically. I really want to go in more in terms of the, the sense of how a crucifixion was viewed in Roman culture. The physical things we can go through quickly. You might assume uh, because there's piercing of hands and feet, and there's bleeding, and there's, we talk about in Christian symbol of the blood of Jesus, that you can think that what caused Jesus to die was a, a sanguination. In other words, you bleed out. That's not the cause of death in a crucifixion. It's asphyxiation. You suffocate. So if you've been around Trinity, you've heard this before, but if you're new, just understand that the Roman technique of crucifixion wasn't invented by the Romans. Like good you know, conquerors into multinational empire that the Romans had, they picked up ideas from all over the nations they conquered. I mean, if you think about it, if you know your history, you know pasta is not Italian. Pasta was borrowed from the Asians as the Romans had interactions with them. Well, so was crucifixion. As the Roman Empire penetrated into East or West, yeah, Western Asia, as the, in other words, as the Roman Empire pushed East and got further and further toward Persia and places like that, that's where they learned of the technique of crucifixion and they brought it back. Well, what happens in a crucifixion is physically you're pinned. So whether they could do it by ropes or they do it by spikes, 
uh, it didn't matter when your feet were fixed to the, to the post and your hands are suspended up here, what happens is you're alternated between two tensions or agonies. If you've had a spike driven through your feet or your ankles, it's not just that you hurt, it penetrates nerves. If you don't know your physiology, your hands and your feet are packed with nerves. So if a spike goes through your ankles or the tops of your feet like this, well, then what is happening is your legs are on fire. Well, the suspension from your arms, and then there the nails would be through the base of your palm or the top of the beginning of your wrist, that's packed with nerves. Well, as you're suspended this way, it pulls your diaphragm up. You can't breathe. Your autonomic nervous system kicks in. In order to breathe, your body instinctively reacts, and you push up on your legs to catch breath. Well, when you push up on your legs that have been pierced with a spike, now your legs are just flaming in agony again. So you literally cycle between agony and agony and agony and agony. Crucifixions could last as long as three days. There were situations where it was a known record in Roman culture that before the criminal had died, the birds would begin to pick the body apart and pluck their eyes out. I mean, it's grisly. Roman law did not permit a Roman citizen to be crucified. It was by Romans seen to be so horrible that the Roman citizens who got executed got the privilege of being beheaded because it's quick and instant. But only, and here's, here's where two worldviews just kind of come together as we see. Remember in Romans chapter 5, it says, at the right time, Christ died for us. Think about it in the right time of history. Two major worldviews completely coalesce. And what you see is a Roman culture that says, it's not just that we're killing you. Romans were effective at killing you. They could kill you fast. They would not hesitate but they could kill you with shame. In other words, there's a condemnation with the death. You're stripped naked, so there's humiliation and there's a message. And Jewish worldview, that the, from, all the way back from Leviticus and other places in the Old Testament, whoever is hanged or hanged upon a tree is under a curse. So look at this, you have two worldviews come to complete alignment on this particular technique that if a person is crucified, they're not just being put to death. There's a message attached to the death. Have you seen your good mob movies? You know, your mafiosa stories where somebody gets cement shoes? What's the idea of that? There's a message. It's not just that somebody's being killed, they're being killed with a message. They had crossed the mob. Well, in the same way, Rome was saying, look, we associate a level of shame with what this person has done, whatever it is that they've done, that they, de they warrant, they deserve this kind of execution. So from a human lens, notice what you've got. You've got profound physical agony, but you've got a message with that agony, condemnation or shame, humiliation along with the death. So if you can understand that from a, just a physical, human lens, Rome was always efficient. Now they were saying, they were sending, look, we want you to hear a message. You mess with Rome, Rome wins. You lose. Only the worst of the worst get crucified. Jesus had to have known it. Remember, if you're, if you're new to this whole biblical Christian church thing, we really believe he's God. We believe Jesus is God in human form, and as such, being God, he knows everything. He had to have known what was ahead. It looks like weakness, so much so that if you look at like 1 Corinthians chapter 1, for example, then the New Testament, Paul will say, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? That we preach to save those who believe folly, foolishness. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Greeks. Consider your calling. God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. 
But to us, we believe it's the power of God for those who are being saved. Humanly speaking, it looks like you lost, and you lost bad. If you're getting crucified, it's literally, have you ever had those kind of maybe dark conversations in your own family or circle of friends? Of like, hey, do you know, what are the ways you're sure you don't want to die? Like, I don't want to burn to death. My wife really does not want to drown. I mean, you kind of have those grisly conversations where you think, How I know what, crucifixion be, should be at the top of your list. That is a way to not go. And if the Bible is right, this is the way God chose. Okay? So just recognizing the act, the human lens, second big idea. But what do we have from the divine lens? What do we have from the words of Jesus himself? Remember, as we looked at last week, as Brown was walking us through the significance of the, the, the setting up of the Lord's table, remember Jesus attaches with that act the connection to this event. And remember, he says, this is my body, which is for you. This is my blood, which is poured, the new covenant, my blood, which is poured out for you. And we're going to have a very significant connection in that word for, because it means in the place of. The question we have in the second big idea is, what did Jesus suffer and why is that significant? And the short answer is this. It's literally the Numbers 6 benediction inverted. So if you've got your worship folder, just turn to the end. Turn to the very back, the end of the service, and we know the part of the service you can't wait to get to. We're almost there. So as we get to the end of the service, remember we have the benediction, and remember it comes again from Latin, bene, which means good, and dictus, which means word. It is the good word. What's the last, if your faith is in Christ, what's the last thing you hear as you go out? You hear the good word of God pronounced over you. Not because we've earned it, but because of what he gives us through Christ. So what is, what is Jesus suffering? He is suffering the inversion of number six. May the Lord curse you. And not keep you, but no, cast you out. Throw you away. Not... May the Lord make his face shine upon you, but no, may you now be cast into darkness. What happens at the, at the third hour, noon? At noon, darkness comes upon the land for three hours until Jesus dies. Not may the Lord make his face shine upon you, but may, it, may darkness come over you, and not may you experience, be gracious to you, but now may you be treated wrathfully. And not may the Father turn his face towards you, but will the Father, the Lord himself, turn his face away from you and not give you peace, but give you agony. What is Jesus experiencing spiritually beyond the physical agonies? Now remember in verse 34, he attaches very quickly what this is about is about forgiveness. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Jesus connects. Remember, they, they connect it with a lack of power. Verse 35, verse 36, verse 39. Look at what you have. The, 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 the soldiers and the, the religious leaders. Pick up in verse 35. The people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him. If you are the king of Jews, save yourself. One of the criminals, verse 39, hanged, railed at him. Railed at him. That's yelling. Now remember, this is, this is in a reference when you are suffocating to death. What is inside of you that while you're suffocating, you're yelling at somebody? Because he has to push down on his legs, which are now blazing with pain, for him to utter any words. So this criminal has to push down on those spikes through his ankles and yell at Jesus. Yeah, if you're, if you're really Christ, save yourself and us. In other words, flex your muscles, man. Exercise your power. Ephesians 5 tells us this. And Jesus Christ loved us and gave 
himself for us. Titus 2, 13 and 14 will repeat the same refrain. Our great God and Savior Jesus Christ gave himself for us. So it's a gift. Again, thinking of, if you're thinking through the grid that you are a Christian and your faith is in, in Jesus solidly, you do agree that he is the Lord God Almighty, right? Can anybody make him do anything? He only does what he wants to. So he is not a victim in the divine sense. He is making an intentional choice. And out of love, he is giving, offering himself. For us is substitutionary. The words of Jesus by the, the Lord's Supper and the words of Jesus through his apostles reverberate all through. I mean, it's in Romans, it's in Corinthians, in Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, it's in Thessalonians, it's in Timothy, it's in Titus. God in Christ for us, in the place of. If you know your Old Testament prophets, we just sang it. We sang from Isaiah 53, and the punishment that brought us peace was on him. Substitution. So that what Jesus is experiencing isn't being forced on him. He's choosing this. There's more. It's all part of a sovereign plan. In Acts chapter 2, after Jesus is raised from the dead, and when Peter's preaching after the Holy Spirit has been poured out upon him and all the other apostles and disciples, Peter at the temple says, Men of Israel, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and the foreknowledge of God you crucified. This was not an accident. You wanted to kill him. God was out working through his divine plan. What do we see in Romans 8? The same right after the verse, if you're a Christian and you know your memory verses, and probably one of the first things you learn as a new Christian is Romans 8, 28, that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. What comes right after that? This declaration. In Romans 8, 31, what shall we say then to these things that if God is for us, there it is again, if God is toward us, supportive, aimed at us, and in our place, who can be against us? For he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us. There it is again. I mean, it's so redundant. It's so repetitive. It's just an emphasized theme throughout the entirety of the New Testament. The cross of Jesus is a substitutionary act of God in the place of guilty people like you and me. And if he has not withheld him, but he's freely offered him up on our part, in our place, then how will he not also along with him graciously give us whatever we need? If this is not an accident, this is the plan of God. It gets even worse. Why do we say, why, why the word horror? Because you have to understand not just what's being done, who's it being done by. Okay, again, if you're not a Christian, I just want you to track with me on what the Bible is claiming. Just, I'm not saying, asking you to agree with me. I'm just asking you to understand it. What the Bible is claiming is that Jesus the Son was eternally with the Father and the Spirit from everlasting to everlasting. It's always been God, one God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Trinity, mysteriously interacting from all eternity. So from eternity past to eternity future, there's nothing but love between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, out of that love, the Son agrees to enter into this assignment to save rebels like you and me. So when the Son leaves heaven, what has he never known? He has never known the absence of the glory of heaven. He's never known the absence of praise and recognition and all the privileges of life eternally with the Father. That has never been interrupted. Now he is about to enter into the place of the condemned. 
Not physically agony, what spiritual agony did Jesus, what horror does Jesus enter into? Now, Johnny Erickson Tata is a woman who has suffered a lot physically. She's a quadriplegic, but she is a brilliant thinker and writer, and she, this is what she writes about that experience. When Jesus begins to be covered, when the credit is finally now shifting in the court of God, the accounting of God, now all of the crimes of people like you and me are going to be shifted out of our ledger onto Jesus so that he can be punished. What was that like? They lift the cross, and God is on display naked and can scarcely breathe. But these pains are merely a warm-up to his other growing dread as he begins to feel a foreign sensation. An unearthly foul odor begins to waft, not around his nose, but around his heart. He feels dirty. Human wickedness starts to crawl upon his spotless being, the living excrement from our souls. The apple of his father's eye begins to turn brown with rot. His father. How can he face his father like this? From heaven, the father now rouses himself like a lion disturbed and shakes his mane and roars against the shriveling remnant of a man hanging on a cross. And never has the son seen his father look at him like this. Never has he felt even the least of his hot breath and wrath. But the roar shakes the unseen worlds and darkens the visible sky, and the sun does not now recognize these eyes. Son of man, why have you behaved the way you have behaved? You have cheated. You have lusted. You have stolen, gossiped, murdered, envy, hated, and lied. You have cursed. You have robbed. You have overspent and overeaten. You have fornicated, disobeyed, embezzled, and blasphemed. I loathe these things in you. And disgust for everything about you consumes me. Do you not feel my wrath? The father watches as his heart's treasure the mirror image of himself sinks, drowning into raw, liquid sin. Yahweh, the great I Am, his stored rage against all of humanity from every century explodes in a single direction in a single moment. Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? But heaven stops its ears, and the sun stares up at the one who cannot and who will not Reach down or reply. Two eternal hearts tear. And their intimate friendship shaken to the depths. For the Father has sac accepted the sacrifice for sin and is satisfied. I've read a lot of books. I've read a lot of essays and sermons on the crucifixion. I've never seen anything as clear as that. Not just what's happening physically, what's happening spiritually. The horror and the meaning of Jesus taking the place of somebody like me or you. Now, if you're a Christian, do you understand now what does that say about how do you grade your own work? I cannot be proud. I cannot think I'm impressive because I help cause that. But if you think of yourself as a Christian also, you've got to own that. And you might humanly grade other people's sins as really much, much worse or much lighter than your own. But this puts us all at a level spot under the holiness of God. Second, None of his disciples saw this coming. Nobody other than Mary 
nobody saw, saw, oh, I get what you're going to do. Remember, every time he talked about the Son of Man must be crucified and the Son of Man must be raised, and everybody's like, what? Or they ignore him or they argue about their own greatness. Or Peter outright rebukes him and says, no, 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 you don't go talking that way. And remember, Jesus rebukes Peter saying, get behind me, Satan. Because Jesus knew this is resolutely where he was sent by the Father. And obediently he says it. So the, the conclusion we have to draw is this is a revelation of my crimes. The cross isn't just a revelation of his love. It's an evaluation of what I've earned. Now, 30 years ago, a songwriter and a poet He summed it up this way, thinking about his own sin. I've run my ship aground on the rocks of this soul. There's no lie like independence and there's no demon like control. I've fanned the burning embers till my house was on fire. There's no parody like envy. There's no fever like desire. I've railed against the mountain, and there was the mountain of my sin, with a pickaxe and a file. Not make, not, in other words, I don't make very much progress. I've railed against the mountain with a pick, pickaxe and a file. There's no minefield like presumption. There's no death wish like denial. There's no cancer like ambition. There's no cure like crucifixion. There's no gunshot-like conviction, and there's no conscience bulletproof. There's no strength like utter weakness, and there's no insult like the truth. I have to look at the cross of Jesus and his suffering rejection by the heavenly Father. Remember, darkness comes upon him. The inversion of number six. And I have to conclude, I earned that. He didn't. He only, he went into that because he, Christ loved me and gave himself for me. So what, what do I learn about my sin as much as what I learn about his love? Which third big idea? The unimaginable impact. What are the consequences? What are the consequences of what Jesus endures and accomplishes? Remember, accomplished, because he says, you hear it recorded in the, several of the other gospels, it is finished. When he dies, he's like, I have finished something. What is it that he has finished? He he has finished the atoning work to provide for you people like you and me. This, what we were singing, the punishment that brings us peace was upon him. That he can say, it is now done. He entrusts himself to the Father. In verse 46, when he says, Father, it's into your hands I commit my spirit. Even when he's being rejected by the Father, he doesn't curse God and die. No, he keeps falling forward toward the Heavenly Father, even as he is now slipping into literally hell on earth. Remember, and people have said this, I don't believe Jesus went to hell. Well, what do you call hell if it is not the curse of God? Galatians chapter 3. Can I read you Galatians chapter 3? All who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. As it is written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the law and do them. But Christ redeemed us from this curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. There it is again, in our place. As it is written, cursed is everyone who's hanged on a tree. If Jesus is being cursed by the Father and losing his eternal Union with the Heavenly Father mysteriously in our place, that is hell. He is descending into hell that people like you and me can be redeemed out of it. He is accomplishing something. Second, he is opening something up. Look at verses 42 and 43 when he has the conversation with the criminals. So remember, the one criminal is railing at him. So remember, you're in your dying breath, you're suffocating to death, and you have to speak, you have to push up on those flaming ankles and legs so that you can just utter th- one thing. So they have to, so remember, they're crucified on either side of Jesus. So can you picture almost the absurdity of this conversation that these two guys are having an argument around Jesus? 
While the one is railing at Jesus, the other one is saying, will you leave him alone and shut up? Do you not understand? We deserve this. But what does he say? Verse 42, but he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, today, truly, I say to you. By the way, if you don't know the word truly, in Greek, it's amen, amen. That's why people say amen. It means true. When somebody says something and somebody else says amen, you're saying that's true. When Drew, Jesus says amen, amen, truly I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. All right, old people, do you remember the glory of 80s music? Remember Eddie Money? Really good tune, two tickets to paradise. This is two tickets to paradise. Real. Jesus is opening something up. And why do we say that? Why, do we, what do we attach, why are we attaching this meaning? Verse 45. The curtain of the temple was torn in two. What the heck does that mean? Okay, if you're new to the Bible, when the Old Testament temple was formed, whether it would be the tabernacle, which is the mobile temple in tent form, or the building that becomes now a physical structure in Jerusalem built by Solomon, which we talked so much in the series on David. So the temple is now a physical structure. There was always this curtain. And when you think curtain, don't think like your shears in your apartment or your house where you have curtains that are so, they're so thin you can see through them and you can nick it with a pocket knife and rip it. That's not this. This is like a heavy tapestry woven with biblical imagery that is on it. And remember, what is the symbol on the curtain? The symbol on the curtain was the flaming sword of the cherubim outside the Garden of Eden, guarding the way to keep Adam and Eve out, lest they re-enter in and die. That, in, that emblem is woven into this tapestry on this curtain, and it was the constant reminder, you don't get to come in here because you are tainted and poisoned with sin. Now Jesus has died, and Jesus says it is finished, and that curtain is ripped from top to bottom. And you talk about ripping something, it would be a miracle, because it would take a miracle to rip that thing, because it would be so heavy and so thick. But what's the significance of it? How many movies, how many stories have you read where there is some barrier between somebody, the protagonist, and some destination, some ending where if once, if we can just get through that, that barrier, if we can get through that door, then the whole story changes. I mean, okay, again, old people, do you remember, okay, first off, I know Nicolas Cage has probably been in 10,000 movies. I know that he's been in a lot, but do you remember National Treasure? And remember, there's always one more clue and one more clue and one more clue. But remember, without giving too much away, remember, there is that door. And when that door is open, then how does the story change? I mean, that's all over literature. This is that door. C.S. Lewis, this is what he writes in The Way to Glory. This is a couple paragraphs, so bear with me. In our desire from our own far-off country, while we find in ourselves even now a yearning, I'm trying to rip open an inconsolable secret in each one of you. The secret pierces with such sweet, sweet, sweetness that when, in very genuine conversation, at the very mention of such yearnings, we grow awkward. A secret that we cannot hide and we cannot tell that we desire to do both. We cannot tell the secret because it's a desire for something that has never actually appeared in our human experience. And yet we cannot hide it because our experience is constantly suggesting it. These things, beauty and memories of real goodness, are images of what we really desire, but they are not the thing itself. They're only scents of a flower we have not found, the echo of a tune we have not yet fully heard. News from a country we've never yet visited. But apparently then, our lifelong yearning, our longing to be reunited with something in the universe from which we now feel cut off, to be on the inside of some door which we have always seen from the outside, is no mere fantasy. It's the truest index of our real situation. 
And to be at last summoned inside would be both glory and honor beyond all that we deserve, but also the healing of every ache. We do not want merely to see beauty, though God knows even that would be good enough. We want something else which can hardly be put into words. We want it to be united with beauty we see. We want to pass into it. We want to receive it into ourselves and to bathe in it and to become part of it. It is as if we are on the outside of the world on the wrong side of a door. We discern freshness and purity in the morning and creation, but they do not make us fresh and pure at heart. We cannot mingle with the splendors we desire, but all the leaves of the New Testament are rustling with the rumor that it will not always be this way. In other words, because of what now Jesus has done and the veil being torn open, someday, God willing, we are going to get in. What was the unimaginable thing that Jesus made possible? The veil of the temple is ripped open, and you, people like me, can get in. God himself has thrown open the door. God himself has made the atoning sacrifice. God himself has done what you and I can't do. He has made a way by his death to remove every stain off of us. He has made a way by his obedience right to the very end to put his real goodness on us. And that's our greatest trust. If you think of yourself as a Christian, I don't know how you think about the cross. But this is how I think about it. It's not just a human lens, it's a divine lens. And it's unimaginable consequences. And I believe they are real. And because they're real, they change everything. If you're not a Christian, would you consider, do you have, what answer do you have for the horror? What answer do you have for the yearning? The yearnings I know you feel because you're human. What explanation do you have for these, these longings you have? And do you have any other explanation that offers you something like this? God himself in your place. Pray with me. Father, it is true that we have sinned for no reason except for an incomprehensible lack of love. And thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have saved us for no reason but an inexpressible excess of love. That you would have mercy on people like us and that you would do what no one else would do and you've done something, Lord Jesus, no one else can do. Thank you for coming for people like us. And that you would go through this agony, both physically and spiritually, that people like us could be redeemed. It's in your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. All right, please stand. Let's sing one more together. me.
Uh, two reminders, uh, all week long, this is this Holy Week, uh, at lunchtime, at noon to one, very tight because of your work schedules, we'll be offering the Person of Jesus study. It's something we've done before, Tim Ostrawbridge and others will be leading that, but Monday through Friday, because we don't do a Monday, Thursday, or Good Friday service. So we'll be looking at the Person of Jesus study on Holy Week, so that's Monday through Friday. We'd love to have you come join us for that. Uh, secondly, a reminder about the picnic so that you have time. If you need to leave from here, grab your own lunch, we'll do whatever you do, uh, change your clothes, put on your flip-flops, get over. It's Fletcher Park, it used to be Lake Monty Park. It's the park across from Lakeland High School on Bartow Highway. So it's really close. Uh, we'd love to have you join us. Uh, stu uh, lunch is provided for college students. Now, if you roll up and you've got four kids and you fake like a college kid, we're not gonna buy that, okay? Uh, but for Students, we have lunch for you because it's a combination with the picnic. Um, it's just a great chance to see people from the full breadth of our congregation. And what you'll see there is probably what you see here on a typical Sunday is there's about two-fifths adults and three-fifths uh, kids, and they're just, it's bedlam and pandemonium, and everybody has a great time. 
So we just really, really would love for have you come join us. So grab lunch, make it quick, come, come join us, okay? Now, just like we covered just a few minutes ago, why can we pronounce this? Why can you be blessed? It's only because of what Christ has done in our place. And if your faith is in him, then this really is the word of the Father over you because of what the Son has done. Take him at his word. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace, both now and forevermore. Amen. Go in his peace and come to the picnic.